All right. Hey, people. Today is um, April 30th, 2022. I'm, I'm, I am Chris Lucas. This is my show, Fishing for Truth. I'm on a few other websites. I'm actually trying to set up because it's really hard to get this thing set up. Uh, that's kind of why I'm late. Um, I also worked about 70 hours so um, this week. But anyway, let me just play this one video while I'm getting set up. And then I'm going to, um, once I get the links out to everywhere, um, I'll, I'll start in the show. But this still ties into the topic I'm going to talk about tonight. I don't agree with this guy's theology quite, because uh, there's a lot of this guy's theology I don't agree with. But some of the facts he's saying about the Vatican, I do agree with. So I'm just going to kind of play that while I'm setting up everything and getting the links out to everyone as well as for the rise of antichrist but here tonight let me go to and ask the question is the pope the antichrist some may think that such a question or idea or even a suspicion this that the pope good stuff, or the right? papacy could be the antichrist they could think it's old-fashioned out of date in this ecumenical era that we live in, that everybody is a brother. We accept all churches and we have exalted love above doctrine that we would simply talk about our Catholic brothers and sisters. After all, at Vatican II, which finished in 1964, surely the Vatican changed, the Catholic Church changed, it became open. It became more doctrinal. It allowed guitars and speaking in tongues. So surely it must be more biblical and more correct. Let's look tonight at this question and we, we will look at a, a wide spectrum on this. If you look at the Catholic Church, it has 1.3 billion members. A lot of them may be bad members, but they are still officially considered members. That is 18% of the world's population, or almost one out of five people will even, in a secular sense, be considered Catholic in our world. So this is a major thing we're asking here tonight. It's not a small issue, it's major if we're Bible Christians and if we're looking at Bible prophecy. Almost 40% of all Catholics actually live in South America, and the Catholic Church has grown fastest Within Africa, the Holy See, hey, uh, what is called the Holy April See 30. in the Catholic Church, is the official government of the Catholic Church. And it is headed up by a person called the Pope or an institution called the Papacy. Vatican City State is a country, a nation within our world. It has only a population of, now listen carefully, 800 and 25 people. It has to be the smallest nation state in the world, and yet its citizenship is far larger. Every single Catholic has dual citizenship with this small Vatican city state. Every Catholic in the world is a citizen of Vatican City. It's considered a nation, a country, a government, a function in political system, and yet it's the base, the headquarters of a religion. It is the home of one of the biggest religions in the world. So we don't discount it. We recognize that the Catholic Church, that the papacy is a very powerful thing. And if we're living in the last hour of the fulfilling of prophecy, where does it fit in? Is it part of the bride? Is it a far, false harlot church? Is it going to be for the Antichrist or against the Antichrist? We ought to ask these questions. In the year 1871, the Holy See, its government, had only 16 foreign diplomats. By 1921, sorry, 1929, it had 27 foreign diplomats. By the year 1985, it had diplomats uh, or diplomatic relations with 53 different countries. I'm leading you somewhere here. But by 2013, 
Look, Look at the change over 150 years. By 2013, it was exchanging diplomats with 180 nations in the world. The Catholic Church and the papacy has never been as strong politically, religiously, and numerically as it is tonight. Never has it been so strong. These people, diplomats, are called Nunicios, they carry more power and influence than any other secular diplomat from any country in the world, whether it be America or China or Britain or Ireland. They, they have extraordinary power and they're appointed by, uh, by the Pope and immediately after fi finishing as a diplomat, they become an archbishop. They are some of the best informed men on the nation of the world. Imagine having diplomats that went out to all these 180 plus nations. And within each one of those nations, you have a large percentage within that country that adhere to you as a religion. So we see that these diplomats are religious, but they're also political. They have an entire people within each nation who are faithful to them and will feed them information. And in fact, they have a loyalty to the papal state. It is a remarkable institution, no matter what you think about it. But let's look at some of these recent popes. Pope Pius XII, who was the Pope during the Second World War. And let me just say, he was also a supporter initially of Mussolini, Hitler, and other tyrants that began to rise at that time. I, I've recorded elsewhere where Pius actually commended Hitler and encouraged him after he invaded Austria, after he was on the march for world power. Pius was in there putting his stamp of blessing. Do you know the papacy signed agreements with Hitler, Mussolini, and going back to Napoleon, all these great political tyrants that have arisen, just trace back and you'll find that Rome has always signed legal agreements with them. It's a very political institution, and yet it's a very religious institution. But do you know since Pope Pius XII in the Second World War, he began to promote and support European federalism or unification, but not only that, as a Pope after the war, he began to support the idea that the entire world ought to become a federal state under one power. He was a great supporter of the UN when it was formed in 1945. And in fact, he suggested that an international supranational institution would be invaluable for world peace. And he also... Okay, I kind of want to just stop in there because there's a there's a point I want to add to this. And then I'm going to get real deep into the whole Antichrist dis discussion. But um, there was like a cardinal, no, archbishop, that's why it was archbishop. James Quigley. Um, but he's got this uh, famous quote, sort of famous. People should really know this quote. Um, it's like, and 20 years. Let's see if we can find it this way. Here we go. And blow it up a little bit. Um, it says, within 20 years, this country is going to rule the world, meaning the United States. Kings and emperors will soon pass away, and the democracy of the United States will take their place. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. Nothing can stand against the church. I'd like to see the politician who would try and rule against the church in Chicago. His reign would be short indeed. And once again, this is Roman Catholic Archbishop James E. Quigley, uh, who said this in the Chicago Daily Tribune on May 5th, 1903. Now, going now, how I'm going to link this back to what that... Um, Oh, where did it go? 
Okay, so going back to what he just said about wanting to create this super national state, I believe that the Catholic Church, because it said in 20 years, the Catholic Church was going to rule, it was going to rule the United States. Okay, so that would be 1923. I actually think, though, it's like, are you, so are you telling me they had no control and then suddenly they had control? No, they probably had quite a bit of control when he made that statement. So they already had quite a bit control. So um, when they felt felt like they had total control, um, I mean, like you were talking maybe like, you know, they might have felt like they were like 5% away from being in total control or something like that. But so that doesn't mean that they couldn't orchestrate a war or something like that. And what does a war do? It, if Especially if it's a really bad war, a really big war. What I could do is make people think about peace, you know, and then, hey, now if you want to create this super national uh, one world order, what a better way to do it than to have a few wars and then maybe have people want to have this happen. Maybe you raise up commun the uh, communist in oh, Russia and maybe you help them to power, which is what... Um, James Aiken Wiley said in, in a book, I think he wrote it like in 1878, if I'm not mistaken. It's called The Papal Hierarchy. Um, but he wrote about how the Vatican would use communism and all these other isms to, um, to, for, to basically to advance its agenda. And so I believe the Vatican was actually behind getting the Tsar of Russia uh, kill. And I believe part of that had to do with um, another uh, piece of history, which most people don't know about, especially in America, but they should know about it. And that's that Russia actually helped the North during the American Civil War, or perhaps the North wouldn't have won. And perhaps there might even still be slavery going on. And it's really weird to me, odd, that the Democrat Party, which supported the South, supported slavery, is so if Russia helped the North, the Democrats were pro-South, wouldn't they probably be against Russia too, since Russia's helping the North? And then today, what do we see? We see the same Democrat Party using racism, using uh, social, uh, all this like social justice, socialism, and everything like that. And so to me, they're still just as racist. They're just trying to you, 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 like gaslight people and do all these other tactics to use racism to keep it going and keep stirring it up in order to advance their agenda. So I don't think they really changed. I just think they, they got different tactics now, and that's all that changed. But there was no great switch like they claim you know they claim that you know that once kennedy became president and uh lyndon johnson signed the civil rights act the democrat that signaled the democrat party switching but lyndon johnson there's this quote and now i mean i know some people argue whether he really said this or not but he said um when he signs his uh civil rights act um now he didn't use this word he used some derogatory worm but he basically said uh, black people, but, but it's the derogatory term, it will be voting Democrats for the next 200 years once this is signed. So I don't think it was really signed because he loved them. It was signed as a political ploy. And I don't, and it's like, you can't expect the people that were anti-slavery in the Republican Party, they hated a lot of the other uh, Democrats' policies and okay, one, one, just one piece of legislation, just one civil rights bill. And suddenly they're like, yeah, I'm going to run over to the Democrat party. I don't buy that. And I also don't buy the racist that had all the control of the party suddenly was like, oh, well, they passed that. Let's, let's get out of here. No, what they probably would wind up doing is seeking to control the other party even more. But now it's like, hey, you know, we're, we're not so bad. We can maybe bring some people over here and kind of like, get people closer and closer to that 50-50% divide, and then they can just start doing things like, well, we get get the parties closer together and you start making people hate them more equally. 
and then maybe it's like you can advance your agenda that way. And I don't want to get too deep in that. I'll get way off track. But I mean, I, I believe that's what happened. I believe they, they they were starting to take over the party even right after they assassinated Abraham Lincoln, which a lot of people don't know this either. But the Vatican was behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I'll just kind of put this book um, right up on the screen so you can see it. Um I own a lot of these original copies of these books, but this is Rome's responsibility for the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, written by Thomas Mealy Harris, who was a brigadier general at the time. So this is not like some any old person off the street, like just crazy person. He's just going to write a book and tell a bunch of lies. This was a brigadier general who oversaw the trial of the co-conspirators behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And in this book, he says you can basically um, uh, convict the Pope of being behind the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, which brings us to, uh, okay, Link, um, Reagan, right? Everyone thinks Reagan's a really good guy, but he wasn't. But he did this thing, and I think it was either, I think it was 1984, if I'm not mistaken. It was either 1984 or 1986, but I believe it was 1984. Um, he removed these laws that reestablished uh, uh, diplomatic relations with the Vatican, and then he created a Vatican embassy. But wait a minute, where did those laws come from? Well, if you really study your history, which no one does and no churches talk about, because the churches today are no longer really Protestant. They've gone, they've strayed so far away. But if you study your history, if you actually had a pastor or preacher or priest that was worth anything, they would bring up this history and they would be like, oh, you know, these laws that Reagan removed, those were put in place um, back in the late 1800s because the Vatican was involved in the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So we created these laws to prevent um, a, a, a diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And then Reagan removes these laws the same time too it's like um between this time and the time of reagan the vatican also became uh, a sovereign state in 1929 um interestingly enough you know there's titles about um a mortal wound healed um oops Yeah, when it signed the Lateran Treaty, the, when the Vatican signed the Lateran Treaty. But um, you could see, like, at at the time they signed it, New York Times, Mortal Wound Hill, that was one of the headlines. Um, Hill Wound of Many Years. Mussolini and uh, Gaspari signed Historic Roman Pact. Um I think this was like a magazine at the time the, that came out when this happened. And it said, the Pope King again is the deadly wound healing. So, I mean, so... So anyway, that's when the uh, Vatican became a nation state. So I, I, I'll, I'll play a little bit more of this video. Oh, you know what? Let me just play a little bit of this to just to get back to my point about Russia helping America. Repeat that, French, should develop it again, which would be the best thing for the world as a whole, uh, to develop a good relationship and friendship with Russians. Oh, so now, I guess that wasn't, or what was that? Uh, 1861, uh, we had uh, the beginning of the Civil War. And the Civil War tore the country apart uh, between North and South. Uh, and England and France were very, very sympathetic to the Confederacy for a number of reasons. England and France felt uh, that uh, the U.S. was a danger to them, actually. They were afraid of the growing power of America. Also, 
uh, England uh, wanted to benefit from uh, slave labor, providing cheap cotton from the southern states. And the French were looking to uh, create a new French empire in Mexico. And they, uh, they felt, the French felt uh, that the Confederates would allow them to do that. And the United States, Washington government would not. So they were actually preparing to help the Confederate states to achieve independence. This was a period when England and France uh, were trying to expand their empires tremendously. England was actually, many people in England were actually looking to try to recover their, their American empire that became the United States or a large part of it. And therefore, uh, if the South had won, it is very possible uh, that uh, the remaining part of the country would have been overcome by other uh, European nations, including England and France. England had a huge base in Canada, a naval base in Halifax, Canada. We had many thousands of troops in Canada. And the English were actually seriously considering in invading the United States. And they were helping the southern states in many ways, including building ships, or, you know, military and naval ships, providing arms, money, and so on. And there's even, actually, there's some uh, tangential indication, evidence, that uh, the British Secret Service were involved in the assassination of President Lincoln as well. Uh, 1862, uh, French, uh, the French emperor, uh, Napoleon III, uh, wanted to organize intervention in the Civil War uh, with England and with Russia intervening to uh, pass by the situation, but in what that was their, the way they phrased it. Russia uh, was long afraid, essentially, of England and France uh, and their intentions toward Russia. England and France had actually intervened in Russia during the Crimean War and helped the Turks, the Islamic Turks, to win a victory in the Crimean War. And the Russians were afraid that there might be, uh, England and France were planning to do it again. And there was a rebellion growing in Poland in the late 1850s, early 1860s. And the United States was also afraid of uh, the intentions of England and France during the Civil, civil War, which started in 1861, went on to 1865 in the United States, uh, because the British and the French were in a period of growing their empire as fast as they could. They were increasing their empire all over the world, and there were people in England and France that had designs on the Western Hemisphere. Napoleon III had invaded Mexico and set up a puppet emperor Maximilian in Mexico. And the British were looking to help the Southern states because of several reasons, including the fact that the Southern states were providing them with cheap cotton and also to weaken Washington because the British were also afraid of the growth of the United States. So there was a suspicious feelings of suspicious enemies uh, on both sides, both the Russians and Americans were deeply suspicious of the British and the French, and that kind of drew them together. And they became the best of allies in uh, the 19th century. Much of the 19th century, uh, in fact, they were the only allies that they had. Each one had the other as the only ally. America was actually the only country that supported Russia during the Crimean War, that officially diplomatically said that Russia was on the right side of the Crimean War. When the American Civil War broke out, uh, Napoleon III uh, tried to get England and Russia to join uh, in, in the intervention, which would essentially have meant intervention to help the southern states succeed and to expand the empire of England and France in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, Russian Tsar Alexander II was uh, sympathetic to the North and Abraham Lincoln 
uh, for a number of reasons. One, he was a very uh, idealistic person who was uh, governed by ideas of orthodoxy as, as he perceived them and wanted to liberate the world as much as possible. He actually liberated the serfs of Russia, freed them from bondage in Russia. And he had sympathy towards Lincoln's uh, the abolitionist views and views that uh, slaves should be free. Uh, also, he was against breaking up uh, the American Union because he felt that this would be something that would benefit the English and French who are looking to break up uh, the Russian Empire as well. So he was strongly in support of Washington at a time when nobody else was internationally. You know and see, this is the thing too, in America, we always have like, you know, some people, you know, left over from the South, you know, that but well, they're holding these ideals over from the Civil War where they're like, the South was right, you know, and they think that, you know, Lincoln was a horrible human being for trying to keep the union together. But they, what they forget was the mentality and the thought process behind keeping the union together. And like this guy just said, these foreign powers wanted our country to be split. And it was always viewed uh, up until the time of the Civil War that to split America apart, like the South wanted to do, was it was actually there was actually like a foreign interest behind that so it was it wasn't just simply as as much as like they keep claiming states rights and we got the right to secede and to create you know states that enslave people it's like it would it, it was more or less they America looked at it like a threat from foreign interests to try to split America up. That way you divide, conquer, divide, conquer. That was, that's the whole strategy. Everyone knows, everyone's heard the term divide and conquer. So I just wanted to interject that and play a little bit more of this. And then I'm, I want to show people a few important things. The only country that had any, any kind of a support for Washington was the Russian government down there. Emperor and Tsar Alexander II. So uh, the first two years of the Civil War, uh, the French tried to get intervention and try to help with the English, help the southern states. And the Russians kept saying no. In fact, they, they actually said diplomatically to the British and the French, they told them to stay out of the Civil War, do not militarily intervene, or that they will face Russia joining with the United States in fighting them to defend uh, America. Alexander II specifically threatened to intervene militarily on the side of the Union if the British and the French uh, went in against the Union. Uh, and he therefore uh, wanted to do what he could to help the Union in more than diplomatic terms. During the first two years of the Civil War, uh, the United States uh, military had many setbacks. And so Alexander decided to do what he could to help them. So in 1863, he actually sent almost the entire Russian Navy to America to help protect the United States. Now he sent in September of 1863, he sent uh, about he sent the Baltic fleet to New York and the Baltic fleet patrolled not only New York but also went to Washington the ships actually went uh, uh, along the east coast of the United States from all the way from Boston to Washington DC and landed and based themselves in New York City to be a shield for the United States, and this is the Baltic fleet. The Pacific fleet went to San Francisco and patrolled there for uh, quite a while, about six months, patrolled that area uh, in case of an attack on the Western part of the United States. And we had, uh, in both fleets, we, we had one of the biggest uh, ships in the whole world, which the Russians had, uh, created in those days, plus many thousands of troops and Russian Marines that were there. And we know 
that the uh, Tsar had actually ordered the admirals in charge of the fleet, so Admiral Popov uh, in the West Coast and the other admirals, in case of an attack on the United States by England or France, they were to defend the United States. And in fact, uh, the admiral in charge of uh, the Baltic fleet, which was based in New York, said that it was told, he was told uh, by secret orders of the Tsar, Tsar Alexander, that if there was an attack in the United States by England or France, he was to proceed to Washington and place himself under the orders of Abraham Lincoln to defend America. Turtle weeds. So I just want to play that part because they were at, they, so if there, so if any, anyone was to get involved, they were to put themselves under the orders of Abraham Lincoln. Like today, you know, most people, you know, they they got in America. There's like so much of this Russian hatred. And it's ba and a lot of the reasons why I even started di digging real deep into this subject about the Antichrist was I started realizing how the churches have contributed to so much of this war misinformation, um, all this like uh, this irrational hatred towards Russia, this irrational hate, you know, and this like like this rational support for all these interventions that America does throughout the whole world. And they don't seem to realize that they're all under control of a foreign power, that foreign power being the Vatican. And someone on um, Brand New Tube, I saw their comment. They said they believe Yovel Noah Harare could be the Antichrist. And so I, I will, I want to to show one more thing and I'm going to get right into that. Um, okay, I want to read this quote by Abraham Lincoln and you can find it in this book uh, titled 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnicky, who was a former Catholic priest um, who Lincoln defended one time in a trial. Um, and so he became good friends with Lincoln and um so anyway he writes that lincoln said this war would have never been possible without the sinister influence of the jesuits we owe it to popery that we now see our land reddened with the blood of her noblest sons though there were great differences of opinion between the south and the north on the question of slavery, neither Jeff Davis nor any of the leading men of the Confederacy would have dared attack the North had they not relied on the promises of the Jesuits that under the mask of democracy, the money and the arms of the Roman Catholic and even the arms of France were at their disposal if they would attack us. I pity the priests, the bishops, the monks of Rome in the United States when the people realize that they are in great part responsible for the tears and bloodshed in this war. The latter, more terrible, will be the will the retribution be. And Lincoln goes on to say, I conceal what I know on that subject from the knowledge of the nation. For if the people knew the whole truth, this war would turn into a religious war, and it would at once take a tenfold more savage and bloody character. It would become uh, it would become a merciless. It would become merciless as all religious wars are. It would become come, it would become a war of extermination on both sides. The Protestants of the North and the South would surely unite to exterminate the priest and the Jesuits if they could hear what Professor Morse, the, the, Professor Morse is the guy who invented Morse code, if they could hear what Professor Morse has said to me of the plots made in the very city of Rome to destroy this republic, and if they could learn how the priests, the nuns, the monks, which daily land on our shores under the pretext of preaching their religion, instructing the people in their schools, taking care of the sick in the hospital, are nothing else but the emissaries of the Pope, of Napoleon, and of the other despots of Europe, to undermine our institutions, alienate the hearts of our people from our constitution and our laws, destroy our schools, and prepare a reign of anarchy here, as they have done in Ireland, Mexico, Spain, and wherever and wherever there are any people who are who who want to be free so 
And um, Professor, see some, and I have some Catholics that try to argue with me before, and they really quickly like left the debate because, um, and they were pretty educated, and they were trying to say, oh, you know, this uh, Lincoln never said these things, um, and I, and so, but you see in here, he says that this quote they reference Professor Morris. So let's see here, you know, I mean, okay, this is one book, one guy's opinion. D did Professor Morse ever write anything like this? The guy who invented the uh, Morse code. So let's see here. Uh, Morse. Um, a foreign conspirator. Oh, well, look, he wrote this book. It's called A, a, a Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States, written, written by Samuel Finley Breeze Moores, who lived from 1791 to 1872. So he published this in 1841. So it's about 20 years before the Civil War. And so he, in this book, what's he talking about? Um, let's see. Okay, well, I'll just read this little piece right here. It says, while we disapprove of harsh denunciatory language towards Roman Catholics, their past history, and the fact that they everywhere act together as if guided by one mind, admonish us to be jealous of their influence and to watch with unremitted care all of their movements in relation to our free institutions. As this work is now to be published in a portable form with the additional notes by the author, we hope we uh, we hope it may attain extensive circulation and a careful and a careful per perusal. Um, so basically, we can see that this whole book is about uh, the the a Roman uh, the Vatican. A Vatican conspiracy, a Roman Catholic conspiracy against the liberties of the United States. So he does go into de great detail in this book about the whole matter. Um, he goes into the Jesuits, goes into the cause of popery and despotism, ide identical, um, striking difference between popery and Protestant. So he's going way deep into popery, as you can see. So it's like, so hey, that kind of corroborates what uh, Chinnicky wrote in his book when he said, you know, Lincoln um, was talking to Morris and things like that. So we, we can see there, there's, I can show you plenty of historical evidence to back up what Chinnicky is saying in this book. So, and that's kind of why those Roman Catholics would not debate me on whether this was actually said because I got plenty of proof. So if anyone ever throws that at, out, out at you, here's plenty of proof. Now I want to go into a whole, the, the main topic of this whole thing, because I knew it was going to take people a minute to realize I was live. Um, so here we go. Um, now, oops, that's not it. Okay, so what I thought was, you know, people, when they say, oh, Trump's the Antichrist, or uh, what's that other guy who someone threw up in the chat room? Someone said, Yuval Noah Harare. Or they go, you know, it's going to be Trump. It's going to be uh, some Jew. It's going to be some Arab. It's going to be a Muslim. It's And it's like, it's someone in the future. And I'm like, is what did the early church teach? How new is their ideology? And what I find is that, um, oh, you know, I shouldn't have left that screen. What I found out is all this like talk about a future antichrist. It's it's fairly new, and it's let's see here. I now got the tab still open. But basically, it comes from this Franciscan monk. 
Oh, man. Okay, sorry. I thought I had it right up on my screen, but... Um... Find the exact spot. I'm okay. So basically, um, Rivera, who was a, a, a Jesuit, uh, devised this futurist version of Re Revelation, which means instead of like uh, how all the early church believed the the Pope was was Antichrist. They really didn't use the term the Antichrist. They just said Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition. Um, and what was, what was his other titles? Uh, man of lawlessness. Um, but it's but basically they just called the pap the papacy itself Antichrist. Um, and so like the term the new Antichrist looking for one future, the Antichrist is somewhat new from everything I understand, and it says Rivera devised the futurist version of Revelation. The, 19, the 1582 Reims Catholic Study Bible was published with Rivera's commentaries included. Um, so they said that, which they will quote. Okay, so... Um, Here's the commentary from it. it says Enoch and Elijah, who are still alive in paradise, are commonly expounded. They shall return into the company of men in the end of the world to preach against Antichrist and to invite Jews and Gentiles to penance and so be martyred as this place of apocalypse seem, seemeth plain. All heretics commonly contend against our interpretation and credulous and discrediting in it. And it says, by heretics, Ribera was referring to Protestants and the Reformers. Nowhere in Revelation are the two witnesses, witnesses indicated as being Enoch and Elijah. Now, I've heard plenty of people, people that, you know, tell me, oh, you know, I'm Jewish and I know this Bible and I read it so much. Even they are caught up in this futurism teaching this. But anyway, it says this ploy was used. So no one would believe the Antichrist was yet among us, as if Enoch and Elijah were not yet returned. Um, the Protestants at the time, of course, and rightly contended with this. For one thing, in Elijah's case, Jesus Christ had said Elijah had already returned, but he was not the literal Elijah. Christ was referring to the spirit of Elijah, which the spirit is the Holy Ghost. That man who came in his spirit was john the baptist the old testament prophecies concerning the return of elijah centered around and were understood in the context of the first advent of jesus christ the word made flesh there was never any intention of actual elijah returning the actual return of elijah and enoch are Je or jesuit concoctions and i agree with this furthermore the two witnesses themselves aren't two individual men, since they are also called lampstands, and the interpretation of lampstand is provided by Christ before the letters of the congregations in Asia, and the interpretation being congregation, then the two witnesses are congregations, two congregations. Those two congregations are the elect from among the Jews and the elect from among the Gentiles, united by the gospel of Jesus Christ, their cornerstone into one body. Okay, so um, Ribera, or that commentary goes on to say, Catholic commentary goes on to say, they shall tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months, three and a half years, which is the time of Antichrist reigns and persecutions. Um, and then it says, and their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is called spiritually Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was also crucified. He meaneth Jerusalem, named Sodom and Egypt for their imitation of, of them in wickedness so that we see the chief reign shall be there, though his tyranny may extend to all places of the world. Ribera interpreted this verse as saying the Antichrist would purportedly reign from Jerusalem, removing the spotlight shown by the pre-reformers and the, and the reformers. So pre-reformers mean the, the early Christians and the reformers away from the papacy. However, 
Uh, he fails to mention the city which ruled over Israel at the time John was given his revelation was in fact Rome, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem had not reigned as, as the seat of the empire since the time of Solomon. Great city is referring to an empirical one, in this case, the city of Rome. The term great is referring to a city which the emperor rules over many kings, a king of kings. Thus, it's simply not a seat of rule, but a great city ruling over many cities of rule. It was also soldiers of that great city, Rome, which had crucified Jesus Christ. So by Rome's authority over Israel, it was the government of the great city of Rome who crucified Jesus Christ. The wicked city being Jerusalem during the church age is a Jesuit concoction. By the time Revelation was given, Jerusalem had been twice judged, once, be, once being sent to Babylon in the Old Testament. That would be 2 Kings 17. And the second time when uh, the Roman army leveled it in 70 AD, and in neither case was Jerusalem the, a seat of the empire. That ended with Solomon. And I will say one more thing about 2 Kings 17. That also is like the start of the proto Roman Catholic Church. What I mean by that is, uh, and this ties into the Antichrist and everything, I believe the real first pope was not Peter. I believe the real first pope of the Catholic Church was Simon Magus. And the way I make that connection is by reading 2 Kings 17, when the Jews got sent out of uh, Samaria, these Babylonians came into the country. Why were the Jews sent out? Because they were um, they had fallen away from um, a true faith in God. They were practicing all these wicked, abominable abominations. And so God had the Babylonians come in there because basically I think God was like saying, well, if you're going to act like Babylonians, you're not going to act like my people. I'll just send the Babylonians in there and. And they can and that, they can run the land and, and take you out because that's part of the judgment. And so anyway, these Babylonians come in there, but they're starting to get attacked by these lions. So they bring one of these priests back to teach them the way of the land because they think, you know, the God of this land, Samaria, is uh, uh, is not pleased with us. Let's bring one of these priests back. But let's remember, why were they getting kicked out? Because they had gone, they have become very corrupt. So they bring one of these priests back. And so I'm not sure if that was quite the like good form of, of um, Jewish faith that he's teaching them, right? Like, is it the most holiest faith at that time since they were being kicked out? So, but in any, anyway, this priest comes back and teaches them th their customs. But what they did was they, they integrated it also with their Babylonian. It's not like they quit believing their Babylonian stuff. They kept believing their Babylonian and then just adopted some of the Jewish religion. And so they created this like um, kind of like this mix and it wasn't a true faith. And when uh, Jesus came, Simon Magus basically did the same thing. And Simon Magus was what? He was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Samaritan. And people don't understand this, but th there was two synagogues. There was a Jewish synagogue and there was a Samaritan synagogue. And the Samaritans um, believe they were Jews basically because hey you know they they they, uh, they had the same religion you know they just and, and they just put a little bit of Babylonian into it but it was um it was really a corrupt form of that religion and when Jesus came all they did was now it just became they put the uh, Christian identities on top of it so it had like a Christian face but it was still their same Babylonian thing it, customs and everything that's why they worship mary like they do isis and that's why they have sunday uh worship instead of sabbath worship you know which is supposed to be on the last day of the week but they do the total opposite by having it on the first day of the week see first is opposite of the last and antichrist kind of inverts everything right um so I know some people, you know, go to church on Sunday or believe the Sabbath was done away with, believe all the laws are, you know, were done away with. You don't have to keep any of the commandments. You can kill people. You can do whatever you want. I know, I know that that upsets you, but it's like, I don't believe the Ten Commandments were done away with. And I believe this is part of it. And even when Luther, sola scriptura, you know, it's like, uh, 
uh, uh, Johann Eck and Martin Luther got into a uh, heated debate, and Johann Eck, a Catholic, cornered Luther on Sola Scriptura and said, you don't really believe this. And this is how Luther lost the debate, because, you know, Johann Eck said, um, it's by our tradition and our authority that we establish Sunday. You will not find it in Scripture. And Luther had no comeback for that. He had to admit, yeah, you know, we just keep tradition. Well, I thought you said sola scriptura, Luther. This is why that's one of the reasons why I don't like Luther. You know, another reason is, you know, I'm I, hold on, I won't get way off on it because I mean, I know this is a whole show unto itself, but um. But Martin Luther, um, he wants one of the death penalty for, and people, to, you know, try to say, oh, no, Martin Luther was so loving and accepting, and um, he was the total opposite of the Catholic Church. I, I man, I know what I'm going to say is going to sound a little controversial, but I really believe he could also be the father of the harlot churches. Um, because we see all these churches that broke away from the Catholic Church today. And to me, it's like they're breaking away, but it's like they're kind of doing their own thing. But they're still like, they remind me a lot of their mother, you know. And um, But they're just in this one statement. I, I'll do another show about this completely and get deeper into this whole Antichrist discussion. But Martin Luther states, To all other religious tendencies act, aside from their true doctrine of scriptures, as the Mohammed of Turks, the Talmud of the Jews, and also our Anabaptists are almost the same. All forsake and abandon the true works and life of God's word requires and urges. Luther goes on to state, the fanatical revilers of the sacrament, the Anabaptists, were for all practical purposes indistinguishable from the Jews. I, I don't quite believe that. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I believe the, the early Christians, had you seen Paul? And uh, Peter, had he probably lived in those days or brought those people into these days, he'd be like, oh, my gosh, they're in indistinguishable from the Jews. Yeah, but they're not offering sacrifices, Luther. You know, the Jews kept kept doing the kept trying to want, think they still believe they need to create a temple and have and, and reinstitute the sacrifices and all this. Peter, the Anabaptists, Paul, they don't believe that. And I believe that these Anabaptists had a faith closer to um, Paul's uh, faith. But anyway, Luther writes against the Sabbatarians in 1538 and accuses the Anabaptists, which were keeping the Sabbath, of circumcision and partake. And I don't believe in circumcision myself, but I mean, I'm open minded, you know, but I think it. It's, to me, it sounds like it was done away with, but I'm open to understanding if I misinterpreted that. But anyway, uh, Luther writes against the Sabbatarians in 1538 and causes the Anabaptists and accuses the Anabaptists of circumcision and partaking and partaking in Jewish ritual. Luther was less tolerant of Anabaptists than Jews since they insu insinuate themselves upon the church and at the same time refuse to submit to its authority. Luther also signed a memo in 1536 assessing the death penalty to all Anabaptists. See, to me, it's like that kind of smacks of the Roman Catholicism, wherein it's trying to persecute believers. And here's people believing and just keeping the commandments. I mean, really, it's like is I mean, I look, I right now I currently don't even believe in circumcision. But if I saw someone practicing it, I'm not going to be like, maybe the death penalty, guys. How about that? No, I mean, I'm not going to be I'm not going to do that. And I think most people would think that's wrong. Uh, and that's why I'm like it. It smacks to me of mother. You know, your mother, you know, your mother, the whore, you know, the Catholic Church, which Luther came out of. But did he really come out of it? I mean, I'll just. I know that's real controversial. Um, but anyway, now I'm going to start to go back into history and we'll go back to 1863. And I found this one called this book called Antichrist, the reign of Popery in the Dark Ages. 
Um, it's, oh, wait a minute. Let me read the full title. Protestant Manual for the United Kingdom, Antichrist or the Reign of Popery in the Dark Ages. Um, now, let me see. Oh, I think it's page four. Oh, let me get it. Oh, page 13. Okay. So. I think I gotta go back to, oops, sorry. I think I go back to page 13. Oh, I'm having so much trouble controlling this little scrolling hand. This way. Okay. Um, a good place to start. I don't know. Okay. It says, and if the experience of a thousand years is to teach us any one truth, he will see it to be this: that the every uh, that every approach to popery in any of its peculiar forms is an encouragement of the spirit and darkness of old paganism, a step towards reducing monarchs and nations like under the feet of a priest system, which is directly subversive of the religion of Christ and has never dominated over any people except to their assured ruin and degradation. We date this transformation of the prim we date this transformation of the primitive church of Rome into the papacy in the years 606 through 612. Prior to this period, the whole church received the present Protestant canon of scripture, rejecting the Apocrypha, it maintained the self-sufficiency, or I can't pronounce that word, of such a canon for salvation, and, not, and calculated individual study of it in everyone's mother tongue. The Trinity in unity was alone adored, creature worship in all its aspects of the virgin angel saints was considered adulterous and pagan. Salvation was held to be a, to be the gracious gift of God and for the sake of Christ alone and the holy and the holy life evidence, not the cause of justification. Private masses, communion in one kind, transubstance, trans substantiation the ador the adoration of the wafer papal infallibility or supremacy the image and relic system compulsory celibacy auricular confession to an absolving priest purgatory and indulgences papal dispensations the seven sacraments the immaculate conception of the virgin were all unknown were all subsequent invent inventions of the papacy or embodiments of the popular superstition at first fostered then sanctioned for their own corrupt policy by the roman court and church this policy having for its object by means the most unscrupulous as well as the most subtle the augmentation of temporal power of the roman sea the multiplication of its priestly and regular orders the degradation of civil government the annulment of secular knowledge, the system being unchangeable, the same effects necessarily flow from it in every country and age, checked, by on, uh, checked only by checking of the system itself. Now, this is a key point. Pope Gregory the Great in AD 600, um, that whoever ar arrogated himself to the title of uh, universal bishop or bishop of bishops was antichrist foretold in scripture now pope gregory at the time if i'm not mistaken this was like there was no like it was not like the pope of the catholic church like he was like he was not like a single pope that resided over the entire earth he was just like of a particular spot of a particular um, portion of the church, but he wasn't like the Pope of today who had, 
who who's like says he's like the king of all bishops right so that's that's what he's saying in here so um so pope gregory the great declared in 8600 that what that whoever so arrogated himself to the title of universal bishop or bishops of bishops was the antichrist foretold in scripture in ad 606 his successor boniface the third sabianus assumed the title thus becoming antichrist of gregory of the oceans of blood which has since deluged europe the shedding of greater portion has been caused by this act of antichrist of rome an act that was at once protested against on the part of um on the part of the British church by the hands of seven of its bishops and the abbot of Bangor in the following record, read at the, read at the conference between them and Augustine, the first emissary of the papacy in this kingdom, AD 608. So let's see what they say. Oops. Okay, oops, sorry, I lost my spot. Okay, so this is what they said in 608 at this conference. Be it known and declared to you that we all individually and collectively are all are in all hum humility prepared to defer to the Church of God and to the Bishop of Rome and to every sincere and godly Christian so far as to love everyone according to his degree in perfect charity and to assist them all by word and deed in becoming the children of God. But as for further obedience, we know of none that he whom you term the Pope or Bishop of Bishops can claim, can claim or demand. This difference which we have mentioned, we are ever ready to pay to him as to every other Christian, but in all other aspects of our obedience is due to the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Carleon, who is alone under God, our ruler to keep us right in the way of salvation. The British, the Britons, uh, states bead, the Brit, the Britons, states bead, preemptorily pre refused to recognize Augustine as bishop or to do a single thing he demanded. Augustine broke up the conference with a menace of vengeance which he soon found the means to execute. At his instigation, Ethelbert, the Saxon king of Kent, uniting, uniting his forces with those of Edelfrid, the pagan sovereign of Northumbria, invaded Wales, the stronghold of the British church. Uh, 50,000 of these barbarians burst in, in, in a torrent into the Howies, uh, defeated its prince, uh, Brookwell at Chester massacred in cold blood on the field, 1,200 of the British clergy, and the following day put to rest the inmates of the great uh, Abbey of Bangor to the sword, consigning the university itself with its colleges and churches to flames. Such was the revenge of Augustine. Such were the first fruits of the introduction of the papacy into Britain, which came as an ally of paganism planting its very earliest steps in the flames in flames and blood. The consequences did not cease here. The Bengal massacre instilled a spirit of unmitigated rancor in the, Brit in the British towards both Rome and her Saxon mercenaries, which centuries, which centuries failed to soften. Edelfred defeated with the loss of 10,000 men on the banks of D by Cadvan, uh, Prince of Wales fled to York, where he purchased his own safety by surrendering the whole Northumbrian, Northumbrian royal family of Ida to the victor. Um, I just kind of want to, I'm not going to keep reading this whole thing, because I just kind of want to cite one source of where, how early the thought of Antichrist came up. So right here, you already have Pope Gregory back all the way back in 600 calling the papacy antichrist the pope himself antichrist 
your doctrine of talking about Trump, Elon Musk, all these other people being some antichrist of today. This is all new. This is brand new. And guess who started it? The Jesuits, the, the antichrist itself. So when you're pushing these doctrines of like future antichrist, you're pushing Jesuit doctrines. If you're pushing Jesuit doctrines and Jesuit doctrines are tied back to the Catholic Church, what are you actually pushing? Antichrist ideals. You are in the throes of Antichrist. You are teaching Antichrist. You are blinding people, helping the Antichrist to blind people. helping the And by doing this, it's like now when the Antichrist comes visit your Congress, um, We just kind of do this for visual. Oh, and this is not quite the one. No, oh, I'm gonna find the video. Basically. So we got Pope um, Pope Francis visiting. Oops, where white? Oh God, got got shoot. I gotta sit through this ad. So anyway, um, so you see Pope Francis visiting our Congress now. This is basically the Antichrist visiting our Congress. This would not have stood up in early U.S. history. The, you would not have this. We would not have the Pope visiting it. Our, our, our um, Constitution was actually written to protect us from Antichrist. This tells you how inverted and how wicked and how blind our whole nation has become. We're completely inverted. We're upside down. And because now we, we go to the ballot box and we vote for representatives that will applaud the Antichrist. Because you'll see them. They'll, they'll, they're they're going to applaud this guy. They're smiling. It's like, where, where is Hey, like, guys, we are giving... Oh, man, they got too many ads. Out a ton of these DeWalt... Oops, shoot. But anyway, I'll just have to let this play because it's this Yahoo browser. So I mean, we can see this, you know, here's the Pope just calmly walking through and getting applauded and um, by the Congress, giving him a standing ovation, giving the Antichrist a standing ovation. I mean, like, yeah, but anyway. So our Constitution, despite what, you know, uh, Seventh-day Adventists teach, because I believe I, I believe Jesuits have infiltrated them. And if they, they're not, that spirit of Antichrist has infiltrated them when they're teaching false doctrines. And one of the false doctrines is saying the United States is the second piece of revelation. Well, why would I say that that's such a, a false doctrine? Because to me... The United States was written, uh, uh, the, the Constitution itself was written to resist papacy. It, um, we had this thing called the the massacre, this event called the Massacre of St. Bartholomew, where they invited the Huguenots, which were Protestants, to this Catholic wedding and then slaughtered them all. Um, and then so they came up with this thing called Contra, what was it called? Uh, Vendin, Vendin, Vendentiae, I think that's how you pronounce it, Vendentiae Contra Tyrannis, um, which is a, uh, a writing that basically talked about how much should we tolerate before we do something. 
you know, because a lot of people thought, should should we even do something? Is it even Christian to take up arms against the government? Are we supposed to just suffer? Are we supposed to just let this happen? Are we supposed to just let our children get slaughtered and our women get slaughtered by this power? Or are we? Or is there some point where we can put a stop to it? Is it biblical? Or if we don't put a stop to it, is there actually like, does God actually look down on us for just allowing it and letting it keep going and not doing anything? So they wrote these do documents. Now, I mean, I know people have different complaints, different ideals. Maybe, you know, there's some people like, you know, uh, like the Seventh-day Adventists that will say, yeah, you just let them like kill you and whatever, and you don't resist the power at all. Um, but um, the United States government was not really the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, it was written for free speech. So it's like, you, so you're supposed to be allowed free speech. But now it wasn't only to protect you against the Catholic Church. It was supposed to protect you from her harlot daughters, too. That's kind of why the whole free speech thing was. You don't want, just because something says it's not Catholic, that doesn't mean it cannot be an equally oppressive harlot daughter of Rome that rises up and does a lot of the same things. You know, Martin Luther was killing Anna, Anabaptists or wanted them killed. Now people go, well, he didn't actually kill any of them, but he signed a memo promoting their death, you know, promoting the execution of the people. I'm pretty sure he was an influential in having them persecuted and sought after and making them flee to Holland. And eventually, though, they, they, you know, they fled from Hall. Well, they, they had protection in Holland, but then they came here into America to try to get even more religious freedom. Um, but uh, but that's the whole reason. Like that's, you know, the, the pilgrims, from what I understand, kept the Sabbath. Um, uh, the Mennonites at one time, they kept Sabbath. And they don't they don't do it anymore. The Anabaptists in America, a lot of them don't do it anymore. But at the time they did. Um, but, it, but anyway, this was all the, and also the reason for the second amendment of our constitution of the United States constitution was so that we could have arms in case something happened where we had some evil government power take over. It, it had never had to do with anything with hunting. It was all based on things like the, the uh, Vendence, Vendentia or Vendence, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, Contra Tyrannus and things like that, documents like that, St. Bartholomew's Massacre. It was not based on, oh, let, let's get the, to give these guys like, a, uh, let them have a weapon for hunting. It was always for self defense and what, most importantly, defense against the government. Um, and so to me, we've, we've gotten, we've moved so far away from as a nation from what we were founded from what from sound doctrine and that's why everything in this world's happening i mean it's like people were let me go ahead and remove this i'm gonna bring up one more thing you know for 200 let's see here 200 years and i'm getting this straight from a catholic ma magazine and this and i can find about three or four different catholic sources that say this and it says papal vaccine campaigns offered punishments and rewards 200 years ago Huh, who's promoting the vaccine now? You know, we see the Pope, right? And it's like when we offer a like, hey, I don't want to take it. It's against my religion. Well, the, even the Pope says it's okay. You know, the Pope, the holy leader of the whole world, you know, they use that against you. It's like, well, no, I think he's Antichrist. I try to make a video about it and, oh, I, I can't say nothing against it. And I'm a Protestant. But the Pope, he can say something against it. I mean, he can he can promote it. The Pope can promote it. But me, I can't speak against it because I'm just a, 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 a nobody Protestant. And you're a nobody Protestant. And and you're a nobody. And, oh, you well, are you Catholic? Well, if you're not Catholic, you're a nobody. Your opinion means nothing. Even if you're not Protestant, you, you know, that's your, your religious opinion that you think this is bad. You're a nobody. You're a nobody. So we don't want to hear it. That's that's their excuse. It's like you don't get a religious exemption for this because the Pope said it because they try to make the Pope look like he's the head of the entire world. And I mean, it's like they whether it's they actually straight up say it or they keep subtly applying it. 
They're still they're still implying it with all these articles. Your own government implies that. Well, Pope, no, he said it. And um, just to let you know one more thing, who invented the vaccine? The Edward Jenner was a Catholic who invented the smallpox vaccine. And so this Catholic invention is being enforced by the Catholic Church. And like you can see, like Vox, it says, with few exemptions, vaccine doubt has no religious basis. No, it does have a religious basis. I don't want to take the Pope's poison. I don't think it works. I think it's a scam. But even if it's not, I I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to take it. I I just don't like. It's not safe. But yet, you know, you had all these children injured for the past two hundred years. And guess who was pushing it the hardest that, you know, to have all these religious mandates, it's the Catholic Church pushing that this needs to be mandatory. People need to be made sure to take it. But um, it, it definitely does have a, and also here in America, the first businesses to make you take it was the Catholic hospitals. They were the first ones to enforce and say, you have to take it if you work here. To my understanding. So, um, let me find some better. See something real quick. Wow, man, this is, might have to try Google. Yeah, small pots. You said I could just type this right in. I'd find exactly what I was looking for. Um, Curious about this one real quick. So it was in 1822, Edward Jenner, the fa father of modern immunization, who created the smallpox vaccine, was still alive when the papal states, under the leadership of Pope Pius VII, activated a massive campaign vaccine, a, a massive vaccination campaign. It was highly encouraged and prepared in detail outlined in a decree signed by the Cardinal Secretary of the State, Urkel Consalvi. Uh, there has been an age-old alliance between the Catholic Church and providing forms of preventative care to prevent the outbreak of epidemics and pandemics. A look at history allows us to better contextualize what Pope Francis has said and proposed regarding COVID-19 vaccine and what he has put in actions in terms of making the vaccine accessible to Rome's poor and homeless. There's nothing new about the orderly lines of people in the atrium of Paul, uh, Paul the Sixth Hall, accompanied by Cardinal Al Almanor Conrad Krajewski, and welcomed personally by the Bishop of Rome, who are also gifted with a small gift of food. So as you can see, this is coming from Vatican News, a Vatican website, and they're admitting that they have been pushing this and uh, these massive campaign, uh, um, massive vaccination campaigns. So it, they're completely behind it, you know.
And but people are ignoring it, you know, and like, oh, Trump's the Antichrist. And well, I mean, if you think this is the mark of the beast, which I'm 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 not sold on the vaccine being the mark of the beast, but if you think it's the mark of the beast, and here's the Pope pushing the mark of the beast, why is it I don't understand this whole future antichrist, Donald Trump, Elon Musk, or whoever anyone wants to say it is. And like I said, anyone can call up my show. I dropped the link in the chat. Anyone can call, come onto my show. Just click the link and you can come right on my show. Um, earlier, you know, um, Paso Platus made a point. He said they don't even know what the protest is about. The Jesuits did a good job of obscuring the identity of the papacy as Antichrist. That was the impetuous for the Reformation. That's right. You know, the whole reason for the Reformation was the papacy was the Antichrist. And now, for and and you did not have a Bible to read from up until that point. I mean, most people. In fact, most people were illiterate. Why did people become literate? Well, it was the 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 creation of the Gutenberg Press, which was also the primary reason was so they could make Bibles. You know, and so they started making all these Bibles, and and people would get the Bible into their hands, and that was a big reason to end illiteracy. If you notice. Um, like, you know, I'm someone that collects a lot of old books. Okay. Like this book is from 1893 here. I'm going to just make my screen big for a second. Get rid of this, but I got this book. It's from 1893. Like I'm not, you know, just like some, some guy just making stuff up off the top of my head. I own all these really old books. Here's one called Papal Conspiracy Exposed. I should probably have a bookshelf in back of me and have these so people can know that. But anyway, Papal Conspiracy um, Exposed, written by um, Edward Beecher. Who's Edward Beecher? Why don't I know his name is what you may be saying. Well, he was Beecher Stowe's um, brother. Who's Beecher Stowe? The woman who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was... Uh, a, a, a big influence on en on ending slavery as it painted Uncle Tom as like this like Christ-like figure. But see, this is how inverted everyone's brain is today. You try calling a black person Uncle Tom, dude, they're, they're going to fight you. Uncle Tom's a bad word. But man, when I'm reading the book, I mean, I got to read it again. I'm like, it's been a long time since I read it, but I could have swore Uncle Tom was like this Christ-like figure. So if Uncle Tom is this black slave that's a Christ-like figure, and I call you Uncle Tom, and you want to hit me? That's weird. It's kind of inverted. But I think what it is is these Southerners, um, I think they didn't like the book. And see, most of the black people probably lived in the South. So, uh, you know, if they saw some black person being like an Uncle Tom, they probably were like, oh, that's another Uncle Tom. <clears throat> and then so these, you know, and so they, they would associate that emotion and think, oh, that means something bad because these people are like, they say it with such hatred. So this Uncle Tom must be a bad person. And they just, I, I, I'm, that's all I can think of. You know, it's like, how did that become so inverted? Um. But, you know, see, I collect a lot of these books. Like, here's one from, let's see here, 1688. And I got, but I got this one from 1688. I keep it in this plastic because, you know, books really old. And I want to try to take care of it as good as I can. But so, I mean, I, I, I study up this stuff, you know, and this is what... You know, the people back then were saying, they weren't saying, oh, it's going to be some future antichrist. All that comes from like Jesuit uh, Francisco Ribera, R-I-B-E-R-A. And that's the, and so when you're promoting this whole, all this stuff, that's coming from all from these future, I mean, these Jesuits teaching futurism. You know, you go to the Geneva Bible. Um, Let's see here. Uh. I want to show. I'm gonna make sure I show one thing. Rise into all this. Um, oops, not the whole book. Uh, 
I guess I can click on that and then click the whole bug. But uh, anyway, you know, like today, they got this flipped upside down. Uh, you go to Daniel 927, and he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week. You know what? Almost there's so many churches. I think almost at least 90 percent, if not 99 percent, maybe even more teach. This is the Antichrist and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation determined shall be poured upon the desolate. But see, this is from the 1599 Geneva Bible. And let's remember here, these men that wrote these footnotes, which I'm about ready to read, these footnotes were heavily um, censored. If you owned a Geneva Bible, it could sometimes threaten your life. If you try to uh, publish a Geneva Bible, it would be a life-threatening event it could be um possession of these footnotes could get your life ended or tortured and so these men who wrote who helped put together the geneva bible and the footnotes they were some of the most learned men of that day they knew about seven to 20 different languages um they studied a lot and also it was rare for a man to be even able to read let alone be this studied OK, so I think it's almost a, a, a small miracle that these men would come together and put together this Bible and risk their lives. And I'm going to take the opinions and weigh them a little bit heavier, if not a lot heavier. You know, when I'm weighing them, I'm going to be like, wow, your, your opinion, your opinion right here, the one way here down here is real heavy uh, compared to my Sunday preacher who is making money probably teaching all this weird doctrine that might fit, you know go along with whatever anyone's excited about today you know the Russia war oh yeah Russia must be Gog Magog um which was never taught um or you know oh you know Obama's the Antichrist you know and they'll come up with some they'll twist doctrines and try you know and try to do that yeah, that's your Sunday preacher but see his life's not at stake. And he's actually making some money off of it and getting people to attend his church because they're all scared and looking for answers. And here's these people, very learned men, not so much so your Sunday preacher, but these other men, they're very learned and they're putting together these notes. So that's why I say grab yourself, a, if you're a new Christian, grab yourself a 1599 King James Bible. And uh, and when and before you believe anything that comes from anywhere else or some or one of your own ideals you come up with, kind of like think about what they thought about because they were willing to die for this. Is your Sunday preacher willing to die for what he believes in? Probably not. It's uh, like I, I really doubt it. And he's not a very learned man anyway, compared to these people. So that's why I say I give them a little bit more weight. Am I saying they're 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 perfect? No. But what I'm saying is I'm weighing it because they're saying they're they're learned men. Plus, they were willing to risk their lives and willing to be tortured or or risk being tortured. I should say they were willing to be to risk that to risk that. So anyway, what do they say about that? Daniel 9, 27, it says by preaching the gospel, he confirmed his promise, meaning Jesus first to the Jews, then after to the Gentiles. Christ accomplished this by his death and resurrection meaning that Jerusalem, and now when it says that, um, and for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That means uh, Jerus Jerusalem and the sanctuary shall be utterly destroyed for their rebellion against God and their idolatry, or as some read, that the plague shall be so great that they shall be astonished at them or astonished of, of them. So, so, and all this says is, and in the midst of the week, he shall call sacrifice and oblation to, to cease. And for the uh, overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation determined shall be poured upon the desolate. 
but it doesn't say it's going to like, this is going to happen right after the seven weeks, you know, or at the end of the seven weeks, it doesn't, it doesn't really say that. So, I mean, this, this could actually happen years later, like in 70 AD. It just says he shall make it desolate. And even until the consummation determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. But I don't see anything where it says like it has to be done right in during the seven week during the last of the 70 weeks, which is supposed to be 490 years each week being each day of the week being one year. So um, if there's 70 weeks, that means there's 490 days. That's supposed to mean 490 years in Bible prophecy. And that last seven years was fulfilled by Jesus because in the and he started his ministry when he was like 30. Right. And at the age of like 33, about 33 and a half. Um, he, so that would be the midst of the week, the midst in the midst of the seven years. Um, he shall cause the uh, sacrifice and oblation to cease, which I believe he did by because he no longer had to sacrifice an animal. Jesus atoned for that. And the Jews who kept doing it, they were starting to have abominations. They started creating abominations by trying to continue this practice. And so he made it desolate. Um by when the Roman army came in there and desolated it because they kept doing the, they kept practicing uh, rebellion and idolatry. I mean, that's kind of how I read it, but you know, and that's how, and that looks to be like how earlier Christians read it. So this whole talk about this newfangled antichrist coming at you and Elon Musk, Donald Trump, all that. I mean, like, what do, what do you really have? Like, I would look at this Donald Trump stuff, you know. Oh, wait a minute. Before I get too far off, I want to show you. One, I'm going to read one more book. The Trial of the Pope or Man of Sin. So, see, they he, these are, this is a book from uh, 1847. Um, for a high treat. Um, so, even they called the Antichrist, the Pope, the Antichrist or the man of sin um so anyway i i kind of thought this book was pretty interesting i actually bought a copy of it um okay i do want to read a little bit of it just maybe a page of it so it was written in 1847 The work is written in the form of a legal trial, and an indictment is first drawn, which specifies the crime of the pope is accused. The jury is legally impaneled. The attorney general opens the case, and the witnesses are called to give their testimony. So it's kind of like a, a, a like a, a trial. It's written in the form of a legal trial, but it's based on facts. But it's sort of like a pretend trial, but it's like based on facts. So what would happen if you actually brought this Pope before and you accused him before a court and you accused him of being antichrist? How would that trial look? And so they're going to present evidences. Okay, but um, oops, shoot, I forgot to share my screen. Let me uh, So I want to go back up to the top. So I'm going to share this. So everyone can see the title. Sorry about this. So anyway, it says uh, this book is called The Trial of the Pope, The Antichrist or Man of Sin for High Treason Against the Son of God. On the testimony of the sovereigns of Europe, the president of the United States and the reformers and martyrs before the right honor, honorable divine revelation the honorable justice reason the honorable justice history so um 
And we're, like I said, it's supposed to be like a, a, um, a trial against the Pope. But uh, I'll just, I just want to read this first uh, page. It says, The Trial of the Antichrist. The proceedings at the Special Commission held at the Sessions uh, House of Truth in order to the trial of, the, of Antichrist for high treason against his most sacred majesty, the King of Heaven and Earth. And part of the reason why we have the American Constitution written the way it is, is we were not supposed to have a king above us. That's why we have a president, because the Constitution was written to be where there's no king but Christ. Okay, so anyway, um, but anyway, it says the proceedings of the special commission held at held at the sessions House of Truth and order to the trial of Antichrist for high treason against his most sacred majesty, king of heaven and earth. The court being set, the commissioner of Oyer and Terminer, under the great seal of heaven, was read, and when a bill being found by the grand jury, the prisoner, after manifesting considerable reluctance, was brought to the bar. Antichrist, alias Manasin, alias Roman Pontiff, Hold up your right hand. You stand indicted for that you, not having the fear of God before your eyes, but being moved and seduced by the devil, did associate with other tra other false traitors against our sovereign Lord, the present and everlasting King, your supreme and undoubted Lord, not considering the duty of your allegiance, but wholly withdrawing the peace and common tranquility of his kingdom to disturb and our sovereign lord the king from his royal state title and power to dispose and deprive and our sovereign lord the king put to death you said antichrist and so forth with other false traitors did absurd authority contrary to every act and statue of our sovereign lord the king and in the year of our sovereign lord 606 in the city of Rome, Italy, did erect your throne in opposition to the throne in heaven. So that's referencing when Boniface, Pope Boniface, was made the first pope, and he held the title Bishops of Bishops. Okay. Um, and in furtherance of your most evil intentions and treasonable imaginations, as such false traitor, felonously, felon feloniously and, ma and maliciously did conspire and combine together with other false traitors, particularly with the monster of wickedness, Procus, who murdered his master, the Emperor Mor Mauritius, and his family consisting of six sons and two daughters. In return for the favor and countenance he received from you, he conferred upon you the title of universal bishop, and you were then known by name of Pope Boniface the Third. Afterwards, at the said city of Rome, in further pursuance of said treason and rebellion, you, said Antichrist, being lifted up with pride by the prince of darkness, did an did in order to gratify your ambition and promotion and, and hold on to in order to gratify your ambition and promote rebellion add various other high and dignified titles in open defiance of the crown dignity and honor of our sovereign lord the king such as christ vicergent his holiness prince over all nations and kingdoms king of kings lord of lords the god of uh, Lord God, the Pope, and so forth, so that sitting in the temple of God, you did proclaim to the world that you held your throne on earth, not simply as a man, but as true God. Okay, so that's where we get in that whole Thessalonian, you get in the second Thessalonians, when it says, and um, he shall sit in the temple of God. Well, we all, all the earlier Christians, they didn't believe that there was going to be some future Antichrist that came down, maybe like some seven-year peace treaty with Israel or whatever craziness you guys are teaching. And um, 
and then that he's going to sit in the temple of God and he's going to stop all the sacrifices. Because if you think about it, why why would the Antichrist stop sacrifices? The sacrifices are a slap in the face to God. I think the Antichrist would be like, hey, this is great. You know, you don't you're you're sacrificing when you don't need to. And it's kind of an abomination. Like if we, if I started up sacrificing, what would that be saying to Jesus? That Jesus, you're you weren't good enough. I got to sacrifice an animal. So an even an animal is above you, be above what you try to give me. An animal's better. That is like the most biggest slap in the face. And uh, to, for someone to even, you know, just to go along and play along with all this, man, it's just like it's mind boggling. And I mean, I was if I wasn't almost like brainwashed by it with a kid when I was a kid, I mean, I probably would be even more repulsed by it. But um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there it's man, I lost my train of thought on that one just because it kind of kind of blows my mind. But there, there's not going to be some future antichrist. This, I mean, this is it. Like you can't. Can you tell me how Trump or Elon Musk or anyone can be more against Christ than the Pope? Where because I mean this guy's actually is basically trying to say he is sitting in the in his place. What does Antichrist mean? Substitute to sit to sit in the place of to take the place of. You know, even in Greek, Antichrist. I mean, in in, in hold on in Greek. Um, Vicar of Pope basically means antichrist. Because substitute and anti mean the same thing in Greek. So, I mean, basically, there you don't get more of a substitute than this. Because this is like someone adored with almost all the power of Christ. Forgiveness of sins. Call him Holy Father. And he, and he can change times and laws. He can change commandments. He can make, can change the Sabbath from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, the last day of the week. And he can make it the first day of the week, Sunday. Even though in the Bible, we're, like, why are we still calling Sunday, Sunday? The sun wasn't even created until the fourth day, according to the Bible. Shouldn't Wednesday be called Sunday? But, um... But you know, but you know, the pagans, they believed the sun was the first cause of everything. And that's why you worship the sun. You wouldn't have life without the sun. You know, the sun had to be, be the one to begin everything. You couldn't have life unless you had a sun first. Whereas the Bible this doesn't talk about the anything it, it doesn't talk it talks about all this other stuff being created for the sun. But um, anyway, um, you know, you even had day and night before the sun was created. But yeah, you got these like lunar Sabbatarians wanting to say, "Oh, we got to follow the lunar calendar and the lunar Sabbath." Well, you didn't even have a, a moon or a sun exist until the fourth day. So right there tells you that the uh, if you just read Genesis, the first chapter of Genesis tells you that lunar Sabbath and all these other false doctrines that people are trying to create, um, you can't can't do it. You know, we already had it as for the days, you know, three of the days go by before the moon and the sun and the stars were created. So it's like the week is not based on any kind of lunar calendar or uh, or the sun days of the week are completely based off of God creating everything in six days and resting the seventh. It's based off of God being the creator, not your moon. Cause now you're making the moon into a God when you're starting to have your lunar Sabbath. So that's my little jive to, you know, jab at the lunar Sabbatarians, which Nicholas Arthur is one found that out. So I will not be supporting him. Even though, like, you know, he was promoting some decent people, but can't can't have it. Um, I, I will go into one other book. 
uh, um, it's a really old book. So I hope I've, I've, I've established that. Um, well, here we got another book. Um, that was written in 1831. And it's basically, I'll, I'll read page 71 and I'll give you the title of the book. Oh, it's called A Brief History of the Protestant Reformation. And on page 71, it says, Mr. Corbett does not profess to examine, much less to refute the arguments by which Protestants prove that the scarlet whore, as he calls her, the beast, the man of sin, and the antichrist, which are the different names for the same thing, is the Church of Rome, or rather the apostasy foretold by Daniel the prophet. So we can see that they were like they were arguing that uh, the the beast, the man of sin, the antichrist are the same are all names for the same thing. Um, there's one key book though. Uh, well, there was a Protestant magazine in 1915. Um, and it says a widespread effect of, the, of this teaching called, you know, basically where you're referring to the um, uh, Pope of Rome. It says uh, the widespread teaching, the widespread effect of this teaching, which was designated the Pope of Rome, which designated the Pope of Rome as Antichrist, was very damaging to the papacy. The interpretation was, plain and simple and the facts of history justified it in the minds of many men unless something could be done to counteract the application of these scriptures to the papacy and its works results which would uh, be most injurious to the church of rome were likely to follow as has often been the case in history of the roman church the jesuits came to the rescue the method which they adopted is set forth in the following extract So, uh, okay, I'll just go ahead and read this extract. I'm not sure where it's extracted from, though. I didn't cite the book. But anyway, it says, So great a hold did the conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist gain upon the minds of men that Rome at very last saw she must bestir herself and try by putting forth other systems of interpretation, such as futurism, to counteract the identification of the papacy with the Antichrist. Accordingly, towards the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her most learned doctors set themselves up to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bringing into prominence the, priest, the preterist method, of interpretation and thus and endeavored to show that the prophecies of antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at rome and therefore could not apply to the papacy so we see that preterism is comes from jesuit alcazar on the other hand the jesuit ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies to the papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, Alfred says, the Jesuit Ribera about AD 1580 may be regarded as the founder of the, of the futurist system in modern times. So when you people are teaching Trump's the Antichrist, Elon Musk is the Antichrist, this was all comes from Jesuits. You are actually pushing Roman Catholicism. You are actually pushing Antichrist thoughts and beliefs onto people. And this whole three and a half years stuff and this um and that misinterpretation of Daniel 927, you are pushing 
Antichrist believes on the people, whether you know it or not. I told you, so now you do know it. And I've given you great evidence as to, so you can see that this is true. Come up with some something better. Go back further in history and show me I'm wrong. But I've showed you something. If you if you care to know you want to, or if you want to continue in your ways and, and deceive people, you can go right on ahead and continue in your ways of deceiving people. And am I some great theologian, some great minded person? No, I'm a guy that works 70 hours a week. I barely have time to read the Bible and study. And so to me, this is more of a slap into the face of you Sunday churches who and Sunday preachers who sit there and tell me you read the Bible about 10 or 20 times through during the whole year. You're preaching on it every Sunday. You're working on sermons for like half the week. And you can't figure what I'm just showing you out. And this, you know how much I studied for this? I studied about, this is maybe about three weeks of study. Yeah, granted, I've been casually looking in and studying all this stuff for years. But man, you know, I mean, I work 70 hours a week, you know, 90 hours a week. It's, it's really hard, you know, to find time to sit there and learn. So you're talking about like 10 minutes here, 30 minutes here, 20 minutes here. But and but like I said, I, you know how I figure this out really fast. I just go back to the 1599 Geneva Bible and when, and I compare what you say to what is um, to what these people taught, and then I just go back further in history and I'm like, does where did your ideal come from? How far back? And then oh, it came from Jesuits. And you're sitting there, and I don't know how these people teach us in these churches all these years. Did you did you avoid any kind of discussion, any kind of debate? Did you avoid like wanting to admit you might be wrong? All for your maybe your pride's sake, all for maybe you know keeping up your Sunday church and your money coming in because you don't want to get a real job. See, I, I would love to you know take time off work and have like some kind of income coming in and, and actually like really do these things better. But you know, most people, it's like they, they reject this knowledge. You know, it's so new to them. They're like, man, you must be crazy. You, you read, like I can read someone, Daniel, and tell them that's Jesus. And there's, I, I bet you almost like 99 out of a hundred will be like, until I start to really explain it to him, but if I at first say, "Oh no, that's not talking about the Antichrist. That's talking about Jesus," people be like, "Oh my God, this guy! Wow!" You know, it's almost like I call Jesus Christ Himself the devil, and it's like, "No, you guys are the ones who came up with this newfangled teaching, and it's actually that from the Jesuits, and it's actually of the devil, of the Antichrist Church, which you would know, but you're going to one of her harlot daughters." And the Bible says, come out of her, my people. That means come out of the Catholic Church, but you also get out of her harlot daughters. You got to come out of both of them. Because if you're in her, in, with her harlot daughters, you're still married to her. You're still part of her. So um, there's one really old book. I want to read from. Oh, I think it's this one right here. I think this book is from... Oh, let's see here. I want to find this one part, though. I don't want to lose this part. I think I want to read from this. I do want to read this one line from page 68. Um... It says, how be it in the beginning of his book, he makes this um, 
pro pro protestation, I solemnly take God to the to record that I certainly know the Bishop of Rome to be that Antichrist and that Popish Church to be the synagogue of Antichrist. So it's like, you know, a lot of people think synagogue of Satan. But like I said, the Samaritans also had a synagogue. And Simon Magus was a Samaritan. And so, and then the Simon Magus started the Catholic Church, what I, my, what I believe the, the beginnings of it. Um, now, yes, it wasn't officially established until Pope Boniface in 606. That was your first pope, you know, bishop of bishops and whatever, as the evidence I showed earlier. But but when someone says synagogue of Satan, I actually think synagogue of Antichrist. And that synagogue ties into the Samaritan um, synagogue, which ties all the way back into Babylon, Babylon, when you go all the way back to Second um, Kings 17. So, but just to let people know, it's not real wild of me to call the, the Catholic Church the synagogue of Satan and say, no, that actually refers to them because here's someone from like the 1600s saying the same thing. I solemnly take God to record that that I as certainly know the Bishop of Rome to be the great Antichrist and the Popish Church to be the synagogue of Antichrist, as I know God to be in the heavens or uh, Jesus Christ to be the true Messiah promised to the fathers. So um, let me see who wrote this book and when so this book was written by uh, um gosh i can't think of his name i know what the rs stands for but anyway it says rs uh doctor of divinity and um uh, wbas uh was like some pseudo written in uh 1621. so i'm going back pretty far to show you that there's plenty of evidence that what everyone's teaching about this future antichrist this is not what was taught by early christians and even pope even um should say bishop gregory i think it might be wrong to call him pope gregory i think because he, he was just a bishop as far as i understand i don't know why that book said pope gregory i'm gonna have to double check that but um but Bishop Gregory, because there was just bishops, there was like no supreme pontiff of all the churches of the world, which the Pope claims to be now. Um, but, you know, uh, Gregory, he says um, the first man had tried to say like he's the universal bishop or bishop of bishop. That will be the Antichrist. So even before the Antichrist system was even created, or revealed in 606 by Pope Boniface the third that people were already on the lookout for him and they were already declaring that to be Antichrist all the way back in um, 608 612 so that's how far back my teachings go and I'm gonna kind of kind of done with all that I just want to reveal all that and Let's read the comments. It's uh, Bjorn says, hello, Chris, the Antichrist are many. Um, what each Antichrist has in common, example, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, the Pope, replacement of Jesus Christ. Father, example, um, Allah, Father, Muhammad, and Islam. Uh, the devil spirit work against men and minds to deceive them by following men. The word of uh, the word of his God is deliberately rewritten to suit these satanic men. Jesus Christ um, was uh, was confronting Antichrist followers during the time during his lifetime. The Sanhedrin the Sanhedrins never believed the Father could raise the dead and create angels. Yeah, I'm going to try to just. 
over to all my platforms and make sure. Okay. So I'm kind of up to date on all the comments. All right. Um, so let me make sure that I don't have any final thoughts to throw in here. And um, I don't know. You know, one thing I'll say though is like, People probably have a hard time accepting a lot of what I say, and it doesn't surprise me because they um, actually have a hard time even accepting non-religious facts and truths. You know, it's like you can show people, oh, no, Trump was for the vaccine and people will deny it to my face. I'll, I'll, I'll even play things showing Trump promoting the vaccine ever since January 13th, 2020, and they'll still deny that Trump was for vaccines and for lockdowns and blame it on Democrats. And I'll show them video of Democrats saying that they don't think the coronavirus is that big of a deal. And um, they're, they're, they, um, you know, they're downplaying the whole thing. And someone's like, no, no, they always wanted lockdowns. I'm like, no, they are actually right here. They're saying they want everything kept open. It wasn't until the, um, the uh, World Health Organization, organization declared a pandemic and you had those NBA players that um, got the coronavirus and they made a big public spectacle out of it because to me that was all orchestrated they wanted them to make a big spectacle out of it um, because they wanted to lock things down they want to have a reason to lock the NBA and they wanted the NBA to be the first domino to fall and then lock everything else down and it was all a plan in my opinion um, but, um, you know, you can show people a lot of facts and um, and they just won't believe the facts. It's like, no, 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 the Democrats weren't elected. No, Trump was saying it. The Democrats didn't go along with it until the WHO officially declared it. But Trump up until that time was talking about, man, we need to close the borders. We need to do this. We need to do that. And some people are like, no, he wanted to you the Democrats were confusing that for closing the borders because of immigration. No, 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 no. He was clear. He said coronavirus. I play it. You know, I play all this stuff. I play him bragging about it. I play, I play him talking about Sweden, you know, doing the wrong thing by staying open, you know, and, and he bashed Sweden. And people were like, no, he couldn't have possibly. And it's like, so people deny even reality, non-spiritual reality that has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul. And they'll deny that. You don't think they'll deny spiritual realities? Um, and, uh, and and some of these people, you know, it kind of surprises me that they think they're going to be raptured up. Now, I mean, I don't know much about rapture doctrine, but it's really weird that the same people that push um, all this, like the Antichrist, making a t getting a temple, stopping sacrifices. They they turn scripture upside down. They push all this Jesuit future Antichrist guy coming along, and the the same people that are pushing doctrines of Antichrist are the same people telling me they're going to get raptured up before tribulation, and they're not gonna they're not gonna have to do none of this. Now, I don't know much about. I know there there looks to be something in the Bible that where you know, the saints get caught up into heaven and they don't say rapture. But I mean, I guess you could, you know, maybe you could say that's the same ideal and you could argue that. But I'm, I'm going to tell people, man, when you're pushing doctrines of Antichrist, don't think you're going to be one of those people. Even if it is true that there's some kind of rapture before some some horrendous tribulation, I wouldn't be counting on you being the one to get raptured. Because you're pushing doctrines of Antichrist. And a lot of things are in, are done in this world because it's done so we, you know, you can be tested to know like who truly loves God and who doesn't. You know, who truly believes. You know, when I keep the Sabbath, someone tells me, oh, I don't have to keep the Sabbath. And I'm like, I'm like, why not? I said, I'm resting in the Lord. Uh, do you ever rest in the Lord? And they're like, yeah, but I'm like, no, I really do rest in them. Like there's times when my job was threatened for keeping the Sabbath in the past. I mean, I got two, I had like a little baby and I had a two year old and my job was getting threatened because I kept the Sabbath. And I don't know where else I'm going to find a job that lets me keep Sabbath and where I can actually take care of my family. But you know what? I rested in the Lord. I was like, I'm going to leave it up to God. And, and now today, 
you know, that's doing that same thing. It led me to quit my job and I wound up finding a job where I'm taking care of my family way better. And it's like, but see, I rested in the Lord. I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to really do things, but I rested in the Lord because he tells me to rest and I rested in him. And, and do I do it perfectly? I don't know. I, I try to do it the best I, I, I understand it to be, you know, sundown Friday till sundown uh, Saturday until like, you know, you can see three stars up in the sky. And then I know that's when Sabbath is over. Um, you know, it's like, uh, you know, before the sun sets, you know, start preparing for Sabbath on Friday. And then, you know, Saturday when I can see three stars up in the sky or I know that, you know, if it's cloudy, I know, well, normally I can see three stars up in the sky. So I know the Sabbath is over. Um, that's when I, you know, I go to work, you know, I told my, my job, you know, that I, I work at now, it's like, they try to make it mandatory and I got a really good job and I'm like, well, you know, and then my boss winds up working with me, you know, he's like, well, how about working, um, two weekends to make up for it since you're, you can't work a full day on Saturday cause your Sabbath is going so late. Um, can you work, uh, two extra days instead of the one extra day a month. Like we're making everybody else do. I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'll work three. I'll, I'll do one step further for you. I'll work three extra weekends to make up just because, and I'll give you, and basically that's giving you double, almost double the hours you're asking for everybody else. Okay. Just to be nice to my boss since he's working with me. Right. I go that little extra mile. Um, but, you know, I, I rest, you know, I, like to me, that's like resting in God. You know, it's like, hey, I just trust in you. I don't know. I'm trusting in you. I know you make your commandments seem important to you. And it's like, and you say, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, OK, I'll, I'll keep your commandments. You know, I'm going to try to love you. Not saying I'm perfect. You know, I mean, your kids make mistakes. Right. But I mean, like. You know, like, but that's what I mean by the whole thing about the whole, your whole life. All these lies that are thrown out at, at you. It's not like you can't see beyond them. You can see beyond them if you want to. And, oh, yeah, you might be overwhelmed by the lies. But I believe God will provide a way for you to see through it if you really want to. It's a test. Do you really love him? If you love him, you're going to try to fight through it. It's just like, you know, like a... um. A, you know, man, stand up for his woman. If he sees like someone coming to like, you know, to harm her, rape her. If he loves that, that woman, he's going to stop it. Right. You're, he's going to fight whatever, even if it means his own life. He'll fight it to the dead rather because he loves that woman. And so he's going to sit, sit there and at least give up his whole life. Now, maybe they'll still do whatever they were going to do to this one because maybe they'll beat him. But you know what? You're going to stand up for it. And you know what? And it goes on record that, yeah, you must have loved her. But if I just if you just let it happen, it's going to be real hard to say you loved her. Just let it happen. So there, there's all kinds. You know, so I just kind of look at life as it's like there's a lot of tests out there. And it's just to see, you know, who you really are. And if you're humble, you know, and, and it requires being humble. You know, it's like you got to be humble and honest about yourself. Oh, hey, God, I was scared. I, I wound up caving in and doing this. Or, hey, God, you know, I felt desperate or and I caved in and did this. I'm not that as good of a person as I thought, you know, and just being honest. You know, I'm honest like that. You know, I say that to myself, you know, all the time. You know, it's like, but I'm honest. And I think, you know, when I'm honest, got to work with me. But if someone's going to be delusional, it's really hard to, to work with someone when they're completely delusional about reality. It's it's really hard, you know, because they're just going to make up their own reality. So I can't deal with someone in reality if you're just going to create your own reality and believe your own reality of what of what's actually happening and, and what everything means. And you're not going to believe actual reality. And that's kind of like where God's at. God can deal with you, just accept reality for what it is. You know, like, oh, hey, God, I, I am too weak. And some people be like, oh, man, I don't want to say I'm too weak. Because that, like, if I was to say I'm that weak, that's pathetic. That's because you already know you're strong enough to overcome this. But right now, you're, you're, you're just like letting yourself give into temptation. So you give into temptation. 
And you can see how pathetic that is. And then you wake yourself up like that. And like, okay, no, I'm just being lazy or, um, or I'm just like, you know, just giving into to temptation too easily. I'm not actually that weak. And you start, and some people, you might actually be that weak. And you pray to God and you pray to God to work with you. But you've got to start with being honest with yourself. And that's where, and that's why we're in this situation in this whole world. It's a bunch of delusional people not being humble, not accepting reality, and not seeking after God properly and truthfully. I mean, you know, to seek after God properly is to seek after God truthfully. And just be honest and humble about everything. You know, it's like, no, I don't want to admit I'm wrong. You know, I don't want all these people to think this. I don't want these people to leave my church. I don't want to lose that income. You know, you got your pastor worrying about his income. Worrying about having to, you know, get some kind of regular job. I don't know. I mean, like, they got a lot to lose, you know. So, um, kind of want to, I'll leave off with one Spurgeon quote. Oh, I wish I could find that. Oh, man. Spurgeon really had this one great quote. I don't really care for Spurgeon much, but he had one really good quote. And that's really weird that out of all these, man, it's not showing me that. Ah, oh, well, I read it on my last show and I wanted to bring it up on this one. And now I can't find it. That's a shame. You know, I think I know how to find it though real quick. Let's just, um, oh, it's sorry, man. It's like, uh, should have probably had this, um, up here, but I know well, I telling Chris, now I can find this is actually a really good video. If anyone didn't watch my last video about, um, oh yeah, uh, Charles Spurgeon, he says, Popery is a her is abhorred by the Lord and they who help it where are the mark of the beast? So that's my final comment for today. Is uh, popery is a herd of the Lord, and they who help it where are the mark of the beast. Just think about that when you push your futurist doctrines that this Antichrist is some future figure. You might be wearing the mark of the beast by doing this, because you keep pushing it, and you're pushing this Jesuit doctrine. And you're and and you can you cannot defend it. I don't think anyone can defend it. I would and okay. I know I have these shows, and maybe I didn't tell enough people about it. But hey, maybe if you object to anything I said, let's have a debate about this. If you think your futurist doctrine is correct, because I think historically there's nothing correct about it. And and you who push it, you help. You, you, you who push it, wear the mark of the beast. Uh, kind of paraphrase, rephrase of Spurgeon's quote a little bit. But anyway, this video by uh, Chris Pinto, which is on this uh, person's channel called Gustav Anderson with two S's. Um, it says, against the kingdom of Antichrist, Chris Pinto, part two. 
I would recommend watching this whole video because it basically goes into detail about how America was, um, it was created to be against the papacy, against the kingdom of Antichrist. Oh, hey, Time Cop, Future Cop. Oh, hey, Chris, question here. What makes Friday the uh, the sad? I, I think you mean Sabbath. Well, Friday is the Sabbath because basically sundown on Friday. A, a, a day is supposed to go from sundown to sound, sundown, according to the Bible. So sundown Friday would be the start of the seventh day of the week. The seventh day of the week is Sabbath. So uh, sundown Saturday, which right now where I live in Indiana, it's about 9.15. That would actually be the biblical start of the first day of the week. But because we're on some, I guess, I guess uh, uh, some catholic calendar or whatever i'm not really sure that we started at midnight and maybe that's easier for people you know to be honest i'm not like a big hater on it but it's like but that's not the actual new day but i can understand someone like i i need it more easily evenly divided um so it's like i'm not saying that that system's a horrible system but you just always got to keep in mind that um, biblically, that that's not actually the 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 start of each day. Just like the, you know, the start of each month is actually should be based on the moon. Um, you know, a, a new moon should be a new month. Um, Bjorn says, "Chris, celebrities, Hollywood stars, and sports players are Freemasons. Trump is an actor in movies and Mason." subject to jesuit teaching to his greatest role was it was to deceive the patriot american people yeah i would say that that was his greatest role that's that's why it was put in here you know i mean would would people have would the patriots have went along with the shutdown so easily from the beginning now from the beginning think about this you switch trump with places with hillary now hillary says, hey, guys, I'm going to lock you down for a couple of weeks over the common cold. Do you think the Patriots would have went along with that? And she goes, well, it's just two weeks, just two weeks. Do you think all the patriotic Americans would go along with that? And what do you think if Hillary would have kept doing this after a month? You would have been like, wow, she lied to me. You would have immediately said, she lied to me. When it's Trump, you're like, well, he did say he's fighting the deep state and everything, even though you know, he keeps nominating the deep states, keeps nominating all these Catholics that helped Clinton out in the past, that helped Bush out in the past, that helped create all this corruption with all these foreign wars. But, you know, it's, but, but I mean, Trump's not saying he, he hates it. So, uh, but I mean, so they were already kind of deluded, you know, delusional because they really wanted someone good. And they see that the press says they hate him. All the Democrats say they hate him. He, he must be doing something right. They hate him. But in actuality, the hatred, it was all manufactured. They didn't really hate the guy. I mean, I, I guarantee you, Hillary, their kids are still playing together. Hillary's and Trump's kids, um, Ivanka and Chelsea Clinton, they still play together, talk to kids. They're still friends. Their whole family's still friends. This was all the show. And even after Trump got got elected, he said, this crowd started chanting, lock her up. And I play this on past shows. So I do, you know, there's video evidence on past shows where I play the clip and the crowd's chanting, lock her up, lock her up. And Trump's like, no, 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 you don't want that. That was before, the, that play, that played good before the election. But now, nah, forget about it. So he told you right off the bat, as soon as he was elected, forget about getting her locked up, forget about it. Uh, that played good before the election. So he, done, he already warned you guys. But, you know, yeah, but Hillary, if she were to try to do this, I mean, man, we would have had armed patriots out on the street. But see, Trump doing it, well, um, 
you got some Q person going, well, you know, it's stopping the kids from being smuggled because they got to close the borders down. They got to close all the businesses down. It's harder for them to move the drugs. Trump's fighting drugs this way. Trump's fighting child trafficking this way. Guys, just keep going along with it. Trump knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. And so the Patriots just like, yeah, I was going to get my rifle and but I'll just tuck it away. Come on, Trump. Go, Trump. Trump's got a plan. And now it's like, they still believe Trump's got a plan. Oh, Biden, that's just a green screen. There's Biden's not even president. It's all a show just to pacify the Democrats. No, it, this is a lie to pacify you. So you don't do nothing. So yeah, you're right about that, Bjorn. Anyway, Time Cop, Future Cop says, hey, Chris, long time no chat. Can you answer what makes Friday the Sabbath with all respect, love? Um, okay, so, yeah, I think I just answered that one. So, um, yeah, and, and I mean, you can find early Christians. Like, I, I'm, I really want to do a video at some point going into, like, the early Christians, what they actually taught. Um, and Because and, it goes back to this group called the Nazarenes. And they did keep Sabbath. And um, that, that, that was one of the things they were persecuted for was being too much like the Jews. Couldn't tell them apart. It got, you know, it's like um, same thing, you know, Martin Luther tried to do. You know, Martin Luther has that quote where he's, um, oh, what is it? Oh, yeah, here it is. That Martin Luther quote where he's he assesses the death penalty to all Anabaptists. So why? Did, and that's and that's recorded in the eighth Sunday after the Trinity sermons of Martin Luther, volume four. So um, and he assessed the death penalty to all Anabaptists. Why? Luther goes on to state the fanatical revilers of the sacrament Anabaptists were for all practical purposes indistinguishable from the Jews. Luther writes against the Sabbatarians in 1538 and accuses the Anabaptists of circumcisions and partake, partaking a Jewish ritual. So, he, and it's, it goes on to say he was less tolerant of the Anabaptists than the Jews because they tried to say they were Christians. But yet they refuse to submit to Christian authority. That's that's kind of what this whole phrase means by because they try to insinuate themselves upon the church and at the same time refuse to submit to its authority. They try, basically that that means they try to say they were Christians, but then they didn't want to bow down to the church authority. No, Luther, they didn't want to bow down to your authority. Not they were more than willing to bow down to church authority, but it had to be from sound teaching. And you went back to Catholicism when you um, decided that you were not going to no longer uphold Sola Scriptura. And Johann Eck got you on that one, that Catholic Johann Eck. And you agreed with him. And you agreed that you're not Sola Scriptura. And that's the day that you became one of the harlot daughters of Babylon. I know that's rough, but someone, you know, um, show me where he repented, Luther repented from assessing the death penalty to Anabaptists. Um, I mean, it's like, like that, I, to me, that's, that's no different than what the Catholic church did. And that's why I go back to saying harlot daughter. Yeah. You did a lot of good works, Luther. But um, you can't, it, that doesn't mean you're getting into heaven. I mean, and I, I, I just don't know how, you know, when God says, um, if you love me, keep my commandments. But you are going after people try, that who are trying to keep the commandments. And you're wanting them put to death. You're wanting to persecute them. You're wanting to make it harder for them to love God by going after them. All right. And how is that not an, an spirit of antichrist? It, 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 it to me, your harlot daughter, your that's that's harlot daughter spirit. I I don't even know like how else can you defend that? 
someone would have to say, oh, it was, it's, it's right. It's okay. I did. I can't say it's okay. Uh, I know that's kind of bold, but that, that really bothers me about Luther. So, um, so anyway, Bjorn says, Chris, celebrities of Hollywood, Hollywood stars and sports players are Freemasons. Trump is an actor in movies and Mason subject to Jesuit teaching too. His greatest role was to see, to, to see the, oh yeah. One thing about that here, I'll bring this up real quick. Um, common, well, okay. So Commonwealth magazine in December 19th, 2012, they made this article. So this is right after the re-election of Obama. It says the Catholic takeover of the U S is almost complete. And they were also talking about how they controlled the court system because um, at the time they had a majority Catholics and under Trump, they, they, they added even more. But um, the article was, um, so the guy who's announcing this is named David Gibson. And he's saying the ta Catholic takeover of the U.S. is almost complete. Well, David Gibson is from, um, oh, hold on, let me find. He's from Fordham University. And Trump, where did he go to school from? You know, went to school at Fordham. So we see Donald Trump enrolls at Fordham. What did uh, Trump study at Fordham University? Um, so it says, yeah, all this. It says he went to Fordham University. All right. We can just see that just from a quick search. He went to Fordham University. But he, he appeared as a freshman in the 1965 print on the university's yearbook. So what I think, what I find interesting is um, the president who comes after David Gibson writes this article with this title, the Catholic takeover of the U S is almost complete. It's a Fordham graduate, a guy who works at Fordham. I think he works at Fordham and another guy from Fordham winds up becoming the next president. And if, so if, if David's saying the Catholic takeover of the U S is almost complete and Donald Trump comes in and he nominates nothing but Catholics stacks the court so heavy with Roman Catholics, it, it, it's like they basically make there, there's like almost like no way to reverse that now. Not to mention the whole coronavirus thing, which looks like it's a hundred percent Catholic church involved, the Pope involved. And I would say that it's Donald Trump. That's an interesting thing that this guy from Fordham winds up finishing the job. Because I think this coronavirus measure pretty much finished the job. Now, I mean, if people want want to understand, want want to know maybe some way to uh, try to reverse all this, getting involved in local politics, which no one talks about. Everyone just like, oh, you know, if you vote either way, they control it all. No, they don't. They don't control local politics. Your sheriff's not controlled. I mean, he might be controlled, but if you get involved in local politics, he's not. Um, your city council, they don't, con unless you just let them control the whole city council, you can, you yourself can get elected to the city council. You yourself can be getting to one of these lower offices. It's not that hard for me. I work a job at night and it's, it's in the hours I work. It's impossible to get and to do something, but I do support other people who aren't, who aren't part of the system, you know, at least not completely. Um, and so you can have good people, but you got to get involved. But most Americans want to make excuses not to. And you're just going to and then you want to blind yourself, believing all these crazy things, all these Jesuit teachings. And you're blinding yourself. You're blinding others. Meanwhile, this power is just taking over our entire government and and no one's alarmed by it. Well, I mean, very few are alarmed by it. Um, so, um, uh, 
Yeah, from from everything I know, um, you know, back to the Sabbath. Yeah, everything I know, it's like it starts with um, the Nazarene Church, which is connected all the way to the teachings of uh, of Paul, I believe. So, I mean, I'm I'm still kind of looking into the depths of that um, and trying to find how can I figure out all the Nazarene teachings because I believe there's got to be something that kept those teachings, some kind of line, some way I can trace everything so I can understand what the true teachings of the early church really were. So, um, but as far as I understand, just from the, the little bit I've researched, um, it's, it's kind of, it started with, um, oh, uh, it started with the Nazarenes and they, and they kept the Sabbath. So, but anyway, um, you know, I, I found this one, but I think it's written by seventh day Adventist and, oh yeah, that's, that's another thing I was thinking about too, was, you know, they got that, the seventh day Adventist, the way they'll, they'll teach about the papacy is they'll teach that, um, Justinian, May the title of the Pope, like create or gave or made the Pope su supreme in 538. But everything I'm studying from the history, everything I showed early on the show, it does not say that. You know, it says Pope Boniface in 606 became the first, um, the first Pope, Bishop of Bishops, right? So if you go and add um, 1260 days to that, 1260 years, because that's what a prophetic day is. If you add that to 606, you get 1866. And so, but, you know, Seventh-day Adventists teach 538 till 1798. And they connect that with the birthday, um, making the Pope stay at the Vatican, confining him to the Vatican. But um, there's actually something else that happened in sixteen in 1866 to about 1870, where it's like the Pope basically could not even leave the Vatican at all. I don't think went outside the Vatican at all from 1866 to 1929. So I would say that that might be a little bit stronger and more right of a connection to say 606 to 1866. Um, just one of the things I was thinking about, but, um, but the one thing from this one article that was written on Daniel 70 weeks um, was that they made this like connection to uh, Stephen being stoned as being like the exact end of the Daniel 70th week. And I actually think, feel like that I think that might be pretty strong and accurate because um because Stephen was Stephen was stoned and right before he got stoned he said something similar to what Jesus said because you know um Jesus said you know when he died on the cross which would have been like um three and a half years after he started his ministry so that would be in the midst of the 70th week, right? Since the 70th week's the last week. And he says, um, Father, forgive them. They know what not what they do. Um, Jesus, uh, Stephan, when he was getting stoned, he goes, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And see, when Stephen got stoned, it was about three and a half years after Christ died on the cross. Um. And uh, it says, and, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. So, I mean, to me, that does, you know, I was reading this article and um, I don't agree with some of the other things they say in it about, you know, the 230 years and all this other stuff. Um, or 2,300 years and some of this other stuff they try to tie into this, but I thought that was a good point. Um, so I just kind of want to bring that up in case someone didn't catch that on the last show. Um, 
But anyway, I think that's it, you know, for my show today. I think I kind of covered up a lot. I don't want to kind of want to keep it under three hours. So, but, um, anyway, I don't want, let me just kind of read through things real quick. Just make sure it's on some. Uh, yeah, I think I pretty much covered everything. So I don't know if anyone else has any questions you want to throw at me or want 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 to come on the show. Um, but. I posted a link out there, that StreamYard link. You can click it. You can either show your face and come on or you can just have just your voice. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap this up because I think I got just about everything covered that um, I wanted to cover. So... Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to call it a day. So anyway, later folks. And I uh, hope everyone kind of learned something. Yeah, I'm checking the chats. Yeah. So that's my show. Um, and thanks for watching. And if anyone ever wants to debate this, you know, it's like maybe I can set up a show on Saturday if you really think Trump's the Antichrist or something. Maybe if someone even wants to debate with me about the Sabbath or debate with me about Martin Luther and how harsh I am on him, um, you know, just kind of like leave me a message. I can't promise you I can I can do this, but I mean, I'll, I'll try to set something up, but it would have to be Saturday sometime between noon and four o'clock Eastern Standard Time, New York time, um, you know, like 12 noon to four o'clock, sometime in between there. And I'd be willing to, you know, have like a live show. And I can even like, if you're like, well, Chris, you know, you could bring up all these references and put them up on screen. I'll put whatever references you want me to put up on the screen. Okay. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty easy going about this. Um, if someone ever wanted to call up my show, you know, and be like, Chris, can you please go to this sh site and show this? And let me explain this to you. Yeah, I, I'd be willing to do that. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to stack the deck, you know. Um, but I really feel like I got pretty sound uh, truth about uh, the few things I, I, I'll teach about. So. All right. Thanks, Tom. I appreciate you watching, man. So anyway, that's it.